So thank you everyone for coming and I'm truly honored to deliver to this keynote and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, lots of known faces and um, l lots of uh, new faces as well that uh, I I'm glad we can meet and uh, exchange ideas. So since I was invited to speak here, I was pondering about uh, fitting subject. Uh, during my career, I was on both sides of the information security and talking with some uh, friends, I decided I could share a few insights from both perspectives. I'm going to progress somewhat chronologically and end up with a rough, rough assessment of the states of affairs. I worked for a decade and decade and a half for a global leader in cybersecurity. <coughs> they all are, right? Uh, been mostly doing work on EDR for Windows and Linux targets. It was fun as I worked with really bright people there. In the same time, I've been following uh, the Apple products since the iPhone was first released and I was avidly consuming uh, everything the jailbreaking scene had to offer. But since that was a hobby, it was an on and off affair. And uh, in the beginning, I didn't invest, too much, didn't invest too much time and effort in it. Around 2011, I found my first O-Day and wrote my first iOS exploit. It was a DYL debug providing a code sign bypass. I still remember the dopamine rush of my first uh, iOS O-Day. I didn't make it public, but I sent it to someone who burned it. That was my first lesson about the scene. After that, I kept digging deeper into various parts of iOS. Over time, publishing various bugs, exploits, and unfinished tools, instigating data-oriented jailbreaks, and so on. All I can say is that I was really, really lucky to play iOS offensive during the, during the early days. A while back, I started seriously thinking of switching uh, to the offensive side professionally and enjoyed Celebrite. We're really a cool gang, and yes, we're looking for talent. So despite my heavy involvement in iOS uh, over the past years, I'm not here to give you a jailbreak or even show you one. Instead, I'm going to discuss a few points, giving a glimpse into why jailbreaks have become few and far between. And surprise, surprise, it's not because the code is bug-free. But for that, I'll have to take a trip down the memory lane on both sides of the fence, defensive and offensive security. Uh, an often encountered career path seems to go from offensive to defensive like start as an attacker and after accruing enough skills and experience, switch to defense security. There's plenty of hackers that started by reading old bugs, write-ups, discover some new bugs on their own, and finally ending up working in defense. Some others took it backwards, like I did. But in the end, life is not always about lodging moves. Sometimes just you have to follow your heart and Mine is building things that break things. One of my first tasks wor working for the AV company was to parse a new type of container. By the time I finished it, I realized that absolutely nothing in the header could be taken for granted. But even then, I was more concerned about the unpacker not crashing instead of being too aware of the security implication. It took me a while to understand what can be achieved with a simple integer overflow, for example. Back in the day, flash exploits were not thoroughly studied, so I had to educate myself in offensive security. How else was I supposed to defend maybe millions of systems with buggy OSs that I had no control of without increasing the risk with my own code? All in all, I do consider that successful, uh, a successful defen defensive story is much, much harder in the face of motivated attackers. The, that realization came in very quick. Uh, when I set up to write uh, heuristics for certain families of metamorphic and polymorphic viruses, after playing cat and mouse for a while, 
learning and trying to guess the attacker's next move. The game ended with a hefty price on our product speed, like 3 to 5%. Playing offensive, on the other hand, lets you focus better on your goal. And defensive uh, often impacts the system as a whole. So that's, that's the main difference that I see about it. And it also forces you to think about a lot of things. What are you supposed to defend? What is the security boundary? How is this mitigation helpful? What is the speed loss? Are there some side channel attacks? And so on. <coughs> Sorry. I know most of the offensive people have the tendency to taunt the software vendors, especially in the beginning when at a younger age and after a couple of cool wins. But the truth is, most of the fails, the common fails, not the epic fails, mind you, are not because the software, vendor, software vendors are dumb. Complex systems are hard to design and even harder to maintain and improve. The average software developer lacks the discipline, code hygiene, and awareness about security implications. One trait I found I find in common for both offensive and defensive security is the ability to think out of the box. Uh, I remember one story when we were analyzing the Flame APT several years back, and a co-worker of mine just plugged a USB stick into an air-gapped infected computer. And um, what he noticed was that the free space on the USB stick was uh, diminishing, di diminishing in a flash. Uh, so what happened was the APT copied the files for exfiltration and then it, tweet, it tweaked the file system to avoid the data being overwritten for a later exfiltration. So the point of this story is that you don't have to be an expert in memory corruption. Sometimes it suffices to keep an open mind about all sorts of mundane aspects. Uh, I have a different, another story about another coworker of mine that managed to reverse the algorithm used by Linux encoder ransomware just by looking at five, five encrypted samples and without any malware sample to analyze. He pulled it off by making some educated guesses about the cryptographic algorithm, algorithms, carefully observing the timestamps and a couple of more details. It's no coincidence, this guy was an avid CTF player. So let's talk about some aspects that gave offensive researchers so many low-hanging fruits over the years. Note, this may or may not apply to various software vendors over time and are not related to one single specific vendor. Even if you understand offensive in more than one dimension, most often than not, you are working on a large project inherited from generations of developers who made their own assumptions about the threat model and sometimes no threat model at all. You understand the weak points, but sometimes fixing things the proper way involves heavy refactorization and a venerable code base does not hold anymore. Things start to break left and right. A good example of that is the resistance of various vendors to adopt ASLR up until not so many years ago. To remind you, ASLR went mainstream in 2005. Special price for complexity goes to state machines. State machines are hard, period. Even static code analyzer can't uncover the potential bugs hidden deep in the mess of state transitions. Hint, go for the big switch instructions. I'm not even going to ask rewriting your entire software in a safe language because that's beyond the wildest dreams and budgets. Also, when not reinventing the wheel, which they do, companies use publicly available libraries, and then guess what? They don't follow the security bulletins of said libraries, either because of negligence or sometimes because the imported software was so badly adapted that continuously merging updates from upstream becomes hell. There you have three bugs. Another fun source of bugs is Exotic coding style, anyone remembers Apple's go to fail? No if curly brackets combined with assignments while evaluating conditionals, a recipe for disaster, and what a disaster it was. I'm not exactly sure that blunder 
how that blunder would ex escape a human code reviewer or at least some sort of simple code static analyzer. We'll never know. And yet another problem is the lack of auto automatization for proper testing, asset generation, and so on. I remember one of the worst fear of my previous employer was to not sign an OS boot component, which would lock millions of computers. Sometimes testing took a very, very long time to finish. Hence, the updates were delayed someday, sometimes for days. So testi testing is crucial, even if that means the vendor is slow to respond, and there's no way around that. So. Um, when you wait for a patch, know that probably it's being tested, the best case. Also, if your product takes more than one single click or command to be fully generated from start to finish, you're doing it wrong. If you have more than one way to generate pieces of your software, you open the door for various mismatches and slips. Which brings me to fuzzing. Well, I'm not, I'm not a fuzzing specialist. I must admit it works. Fuzzing is intended to cover all the things we can think about a creative attacker might hit us with. At the end of the day, we can formally prove our piece of code is infallible, so let the holy randomness bring in some solace. However, fuzzing was introduced late in, my, in many companies, if ever, leading to frustration because most bug hunters were reporting bugs uncovered by really dumb fuzzers. I know that uh, because uh, at some point I wrote uh, another unpacker, uh, which I didn't fully understand. So I actually re-implemented it by reverse engineering. And the unpacker, the original unpacker, was full of, full of bugs. And um, we didn't fuzz it. And we had lots and lots of reports on that. So lesson learned. Even some of the finest, but fuzzing aside, even some of the fine, finest bugs I ever saw were almost impossible to uncover by fuzzing. So that's not excuse to skip fuzzing, but something to keep in mind. So I was on both ends of a bug bounty, and I was amazed at how creative some attackers can be. Even so, the security patches barely covered the specific bugs instead of a general upgrade in security. Uh, also, there are good bug bounties and bad bug bounties, where at least one side wants to cheat or haggle, whatever. A fun story, one, once I was in charge of estimating the impact of a bug, and I realized it can't be exploited with only the reported bug. In reality, the reporter had another different bug which allowed him to break the ASLR. And the bounty was awarded only after he revealed the existence of the second bug. Uh, and we patched both. However, the underlying technique remained because it was deemed too dangerous and costly to restructure it all back at the time. So yeah, the lack of differential bug an analysis from the vendors is a thing. Talent is expensive and sometimes scarce. Some vendors began to understand that in order to provide a good defense, they need to understand and employ defensive mentality. And the cheapest way to do that is by leeching the community by luring researchers that have acquired vast knowledge by reversing on their own, on, on their own time and money. But such talent must be retained with incentives and or money. Otherwise, it will flee. So the points I made so far are not meant to be an exhaustive list of software security problems. They merely represent low-hanging trees with low-hanging fruits. And these fruits are becoming things of the past, at least from certain software vendors. And we have to wonder, did they fix all that? Some have improved to some extent, and some others resorted to the silver bullet. Yeah, the answer to that is mitigations. Of mitigations, I'm going to make Apple a case study for several reasons. I'm somewhat familiar with the target from the offensive point of view. Um, second reason is that Apple seems to be everyone's favorite. 
Um, third reason, Apple is pumping mitigation like there's no tomorrow and doesn't seem to be stopping. Uh, but this time, let's take a look at them from the other side, so the offensive side, and um, there might be some timeline time, time inaccuracies, inaccuracy, but please bear with me, the timeline is not that important. First, a few words about offensive research. So if you think about it, all exploitable memory corruption is a special class of type confusion. This is a quote, a f philosophical musing of uh, one of my friends. He goes by the name of QRT, maybe you know him. And I tried to disagree with him, but eventually conceded the point. Uh, for a more enlightening, albeit somewhat theoretical approach to exploits, go read Exploitation and State Machines by Halbert Flake. I think it was 2011. Uh, the too long didn't read of, of it is when you're writing an exploit, you're actually programmer with machines. So in a sense, you become a programmer behind the programmer. It's not easy to write secure code, but isn't it more fun to subvert insecure code? Exploiting systems were extremely easy a decade or two ago, but uh, have, become, have become much more difficult in recent years, and we'll go over the reasons why it became that way. Some systems are harder than others with very steep learning curves nowadays. And um, lonely researchers building full chains are almost an extinct species. The reason I'm referring to iOS will become apparent a bit later. So when it, for, when it was first re released, iOS 1 was a walk in the park, a buffer overflow in libtif, and that it was all it took to subvert the complete system. Code signing was introduced in iOS 2. It is meant to authenticate software origin, but also to hold the grip over software distribution. It also provides a mechanism by which entitlements get embedded into a binary. Entitlements then dictate some of the rules a binary is allowed to break. There were some early user land code sign bypasses which were important for untethered jailbreaks, also known as persistency, via interposition in early jailbreaks by COMEX and the Evaders team, via enterprise certificate and overlapping segments by Pangu, via crafted multi-architecture executable files by TAIG, uh, via DYLD closures by Linus Hensen, all these methods, except the enterprise certificate, exploited bugs in DYLD, the dynamic linker. Other notable mentions is MapJIT by Charlie Miller, and then again via a uh, MMAP hook by Max Bazali, and then again via IO Surface by Luca Todesco. So there was plenty of bypasses back then. Along with code signing, there came the sandbox based primarily on mandatory access control. It is a first line of defense in privilege escalation scenarios, and for the longest time, it was the stronger contributor to iOS security. It was bypassed early on by manipulating launch D config files, as well as other privileged demons and applications. The crea creativity of iOS hackers really shown in this area, but the list is just too long to mention them all. Address space layout randomization became mainstream around 2005, but it took Apple about six years to catch up. While not the strongest mitigation of the bunch, Apple's ASLR was even weaker because they, the way that the YLD shared cache worked. However, there was plenty of info leaks out there, owing to the naivete of years ago. Mac, wherein kernel addresses were used as identifiers and different other examples. Think the Mac port kernel object APIs. And when there were none, no, no leaks, info leaks are made not found, again, as Halbert Blake put it many years ago. Special mention, brute force was used to defeat the DYLD shared cache slide by Siguza in iOS 11. As the old saying goes, if brute force doesn't work, then you're not using enough. 
Apple started to trim out function at the same time. Apple started to trim out functionality from the software built for the phone. For example, while in earlier iOS, all that you had to do was to get root and disable the sandbox via security mark proc and force and we know stuff. This mechanism began to disappear. The jailbreaks needed to escalate to kernel to perform correctly. Starting with iOS 7, Apple introduced the first ARM64 SOC. While this is technically not a mitigation in itself, it's worth mentioning because here's when the fun began. And by fun, I mean SMAP, Supervisor Mode Access Prevention, uh, I mean PAN, Privileged Access Never, was gone. Nobody knows why. An interesting detail is that uh, ARM 8.1 has a hardware bug, which would have, made, would have made PAN less than useful anyway, also discovered by Siguza and then independently by the Linux folks. Long story short, execute only mappings in New Zealand won't fault anymore when reading from, from them in kernel mode. Anyway, PAN would make a comeback with iPhone 7 and later, starting with iOS 10, but it was easily bypassed uh, using kernel pipe structures. And then along with the ARM64 chip, the iPhone saw the introduction of SEP, which is a separate coprocessor dealing with sensible crypto material. This was a major paradigm shift. It would fall much later by exploiting the way Trust Zone was set. iOS 8 brings a landmark shift in, in security design. The entitlements, remember code signing, they had, the effect, they had it effectively since iOS 2, but now the idea is to embed simple strings into the code signature blob. The kernel can then verify these entitlements. Uh, and indeed, uh, grant rights to certain binary. This opens immense possibilities, both for securing IPC and also for tightening the sandbox. The sandbox is more restrictive, denying much more by default, and you need entitlement X or Y for operation X or Y. And with IPC, you can restrict a certain method of IPC or method of XPC. For example, if the server demands the caller first have the entitlement. From a different perspective, this is similar to the idea of set UID, set GUID in Unix, but that is all or none. Here is a much more granular way of uh, granting capabilities. Yes, indeed, Apple keeps adding more and more ent entitlements as iOS progresses, so much that you need an actual website. I recommend Jonathan Levin's entitlement database for the auto authority resource on them. Along with A7 came the infamous KPP, aka Watchtower. It consisted uh, of an EL3 monitor that would guard kernel and uh, page tables. The monitor would work by trapping the FPU and uh, IRQ. At first, it was a mysterious force protecting the kernel, um, but the monitor code was hiding actually in plain sight. It was tucked after the, the kernel proper. I must admit I missed it at first, and that reminded, reminded me of the old mantra, look everywhere, try even the craziest thing. Once discovered, it was analyzed uh, and decisively beaten by Luca Todesco. He did it by stealing away the CPACREL1 access and exploiting the Talk to race. The, it was, so the watchtower was basically a time filler, my guess, until uh, iPhone 7 brought up uh, KTRR. Speaking of which, Pan made a comeback with iPhone 7 on iOS 10, along with more hardening, the big targets, kernel and WebKit, kernel got a shiny new mitigation, the KTRR. While interesting in concept, it's a don't write inside, don't execute outside region, it was quickly defeated by the very same Lucato Desco by hijacking code execution on CPU start resume. 
because the G word base and G physical base were writable back then. And after that, he just dropped everything else to change TTBR1, EL1. Fun fact, the instruction for, change, for change, changing that uh, TTBR1, EL1 was meant to be unavailable. Um, I still haven't found out if it was an off by one overlook on the Apple side or nobody knows. Later on, Gal Benjamini of Google Project Zero published a Wi-Fi stack exploit in which he cleverly used KTRR re registers to derive the KSLR slide, the kernel slide. In my opinion, this was the biggest example of a mitigation breaking another. But in reality, KTRR forced us to rethink our strategies and uh, rely mostly on data-oriented jailbreaks. The next logical target was, of course, the trust cache. On the WebKit side, JIT had two separate mappings, one read-write, the other read-execute with a special memcopy function. It was announced with great fanfare by Ivan Kerstich at Black Hat 2016, I think. This feature was ultimately useless because uh, one could just use bigger bullets. Invoke that memcopy function with rob, job, whatever. So it was a no-brainer. Last but not least, jailbreaks would have to ditch the old remounting tricks, which involved modifying the kernel code because of uh, the very same KTRR. However, this was bypassable by looking up the vnode and clearing the root flag. The biggest thing about iPhone 8 was the 64-bit uh, set, which was not vulnerable to Blackbird. Also, at the same time, they decided the dual mapping JIT was not the greatest idea, just as useful as the bulletproof JIT, since we're still able to wrap the code, so even bigger bullets. And of course, the mandatory co uh, signature ha was hardened. Not very hard to break with a kernel read-write, though. And now we're talking some major changes. ARM 8.3 provides pointer authentication, which allows for control flow integrity. Basically, at this point, ROP is dead. Still, there were plenty of weaknesses, as assessed by Brandon Azad of Google Project Zero. Zero. I mean, he was working for them initially. PAC uh, protected only code pointers, leaving some interesting data-only attacks open. But the A12 came with yet, yet another security thing called the Panacea Protection, uh, sorry, Page Protection Layer, the PPL. Uh, the idea was to create a kernel inside a kernel that protects the page tables. It also fell in a fight with Brandon Azad pretty early. But it is worth noting that PPL kept evolving to become one of the Hardest not to crack, so hats off for that. Also, Siguza noticed that ARM 8.1 execute only bug has hit again, another case of mitigation breaking another. So while attempting to stop one-click exploits, Apple turned its attention to the obvious target, which is WebKit. Um, so in order to build fake objects, which was the bread and butter of web, WebKit exploitation back in the day, an attacker had to know the structure ID of the object to be forged. Trying to prevent this, Apple added randomization to that field. Uh, however, this was bypassed fairly easily using various met methods. Another favorite technique of an attacker was to hijack a typed array in order to build a reliable read-write primitive inside WebKit. To stop that, Apple caged the storage of typed array, but the attackers moved to using JS array butterflies instead. With iOS 14, more cost, core trust hardening came in order to prevent, to prevent fake signing. Really, 
this is just to piss people off, but they got what they deserved in a way. Core trust was, core trust was found to improperly validate that the root certificate of the Marco certificate change matches the Apple root. Wow. Blastdoor, the pride and joy of some smart Apple employee, is generally actually a good idea. Take the file format parsers. I know, because I wrote a lot of parsers back in the day. And put them in a tightly contained sandbox. Let's say there's some exploitable issue, fine, in box we trust. Surely the sandbox will contain it and compartmentalize the, the possible exploit, right? Well, not really. The blast pass exploit involved pass kit attachment contain, containing malicious images, so this was also defeated. A lot of changes in, uh, since iOS 14 in the kernel land, which is zone require, make it hard to create fake tasks, processes, ports, and all sorts of objects which have their own designated zones now. The read-only zones, which you, you can allocate and in it, but effectively, effectively they, they, they're made read-only immediately thereafter, so they can be changed. And this is also enforced by PPL. Um, and then there's zone split and uh, split to So the zone split, take the catch-all of gen or, or generic zone, say calloc, split to data calloc, default calloc, and regular calloc, as well as calloc type and variants and so on, to make zone feng shui significantly harder. Around this time, I gave, I gave up working alone, as it became, became not impossible to pull something meaningful off. Also, Coincidentally, the public info decreased drastically. With iOS 15, Apple takes a page from Android and introduces APFS volume ceiling. Android has long, I think since 5.0, had DMCrypt, which filters block devices and verifies the hashes on a per block basis. Uh, that means you can't corrupt blocks. And uh, initially, Apple thought that because their root FS was mounted read-only uh, and they used snapshots and whatnot, persistence by file tampering would be impossible. Yeah, it was hard, okay, maybe, but impossible, not at all. Uh, so APFS volume ceiling came to, to fix that once and for all. Also, as a side note, I, Apple A15 uh, introduced uh, new things on the WebKit front, the JITBOX. Yeah. With iOS 16, developer mode takes all these features that of provisioning for development, the developer disk image, debugging entitlements, and disables them by default. Without the DDI, uh, there is less need for dynamic trust caches, so this helps resolve the trust cache in injection problem. And even if powerful debugging entitlements could be somehow faked or usurped, they would not be honored. So the idea was that the d developers that do need it still can enable it, and though Apple has hundreds of thousands of developers, this helps to protect the many millions that never need it or heard about it. And also the lockdown mode, whereas the dev mode is something most people haven't heard about and leave it off by default, lockdown is an entirely different story. This has an actual effect on the user experience in that most of file formats are simply not parsed. This is worth reiterating. Don't try to secure the code behind dangerous functionality if you can just disable the functionality. Remember, I mentioned BlastPass only what some slides ago. Well, despite their best efforts at sandboxing, it failed. But devices with lockdown mode were in fact resistant. 
And this was indeed Citizen Lab's recommendation as well. And I would say my recommendation to you in, in the audience, you never know if you're a target, so go and enable the lockdown mode like right now. And we end up in the present day, sort of, because there are still a lot of moving parts here. I was seven, uh, 17 IPSWs, contained two new files, TXM something something, and uh, SPTM something something else. Reversing them shows that uh, TXM is the trusted execution monitor and handles a lot of what used to be PPL code signing. And SPTM is the secure page table manager, which acts like uh, PPL did. In other words, it handles the PTE management. And then there are some mention of exclaves and further hints at CL4, Apple's take on the L4 microkernel used also in CEPOS. The world expected probably to, this to be revealed in, with the iPhone 15, but it looks like we'll see it only a bit later in the mid-season release, maybe 17.2 or 3, we can just speculate. Uh, my hunch, and I might be wrong here, is that they are compartmentalizing SNU so that these sensitive code blocks are now physically separate, just like the exclave parts of a country in a geopolitical sense. And so compromise of the kernel would still not mess up code signing or page table management. And then going forward, I would make it that even kernel compromise and ostensible code execution would prevent you from then going into user mode memory and reading sensitive user mode app data, which let's not forget is what APT developers are after in the first place. Things are improving in the user land too with allocator hardening. I have to stop here and can't even pretend I touched all the mitigations. Having more examples won't make this talk talk any better, really. Uh, what we can expect uh, in the future? Well, MTE provides the mechanism that allow, allows us to detect both use after free and out of bounds type of bugs. Um, it was being designed in such a way that no source code modifications are required, so it's the natural step to go. Uh, the MTE underlying model is the lock and key scheme, so basically, what means that when memory is allocated or freed, it is given a tag, which is the lock, and then all access to that memory must be made by a pointer with the same tag, which is the key. If the lock and key do not match, then the CPU raises an exception. That's how it works, basically, in two words. Uh, fun fact, it seems Apple lost the race on this one. For the first time, Google is taking the lead with Pixel 8. So to sum it up, there are mitigations and mitigations. Most of, them, most of them fell over time, yielding before the creativity of the attackers, only to, to be reinforced later, and the cat and mouse game continued, showcasing the underlying systemic problems of maintaining large code bases. Some mitigations were pointless, others were just time fillers, others just still just to annoy jailbreakers. And indeed, up to some point, it looked like Apple lost the distinction of whom to defend against, jailbreakers uh, or APT developers. But the sheer amount of Apple mitigations is impressive, and there's a bunch of them that are crazy effective. Some of them are even good enough at covering the systemic problems that I talked about in the first part of, the, of this talk. And now, for cir full circle having we come. In the beginning, I told you I'm not here to show you a jailbreak, and I hope you can understand why. So the effort spent in defeating mitigations have skyrocketed, which raised the cost of building uh, reliable exploits. Up to 2019 or 2020, most mitigations seem to hinder post-exploitation only but it's not the case anymore. So pretty much they're burying us with mitigations. In conclusion, 
some vendors have caught up and they deserve, deserve some respect and I'm looking at Apple here. But at the same time, we're trying to do our best as well. A good attacker is extremely familiar with the target subsystem and the mitigations thereof. But a brilliant attacker can speculate on future course of action in the wake of rumored mitigations while abstracting away some prerequisites like a read-write primitive, for example. So we'll keep up the fight. Having control over the hardware, and this is an important point, having control over the, over the hardware and no fear in pushing it uh, to the client base has a tremendous advantage in terms of security that puts Apple in a very, very good position since they control everything from the silicon to the hardware, to the software, sorry. But even so, we will continue to challenge them for fun and profit. Thank you and enjoy Hexacon.